So I'm gonna go with the, uh, I'm gonna go with this because that thing was kind of a pain. Um, and it seemed like uh, it uh, kept me from moving around, which I, I, I love to move around. So part two of sort of salt and light is salt. And just to take you back a little bit to thinking about how we teed this up, uh, you might uh, remember this particular slide. My hope for you is that my experience, uh, Dennis said wealth of experience, some of that school of hard knocks kind of experience, that you would be able to take that and not make it an inevitability that there's a derail moment for you, that you headed off at the pass, that you think about things that you might want to do in your life that are different than the things that I did early in my life, that you wouldn't have to learn that experience the hard way. And I don't know if it was obvious to you guys as I was telling my story, but as I look back on the things that happened around September of 94 and the year after that, and then over the past, you know, almost, what is it, 20 Five years, wow. Um, God disciplines his children. And that moment in time was a disciplining moment. And then he put me in time out for that year that I was doing my one-man thing and healed me during that process. And I wouldn't be here talking to you without that moment. And if that moment hadn't happened and I kept on the tra trajectory that I was on, it might have been more like the catastrophic derailments that Tim talks about in, in this book. So praise God that he didn't allow that to happen in my life. Praise God that it was a small derailment as far as how those things go instead of the big one. And I appreciate uh, all the experiences that I have, even the ones that you know, are not so much fun. Five lessons that Tim Irwin talked about, there they are, and I said that the one that we're focused on in this lesson is this Lack of self and other awareness is a common denominator in all derailments. And when we're talking about salt and light, and if you think about light as being enlightened to others in your life, and that you need to, to think of them as image bearers, that you need to love them with that knowledge that you're seeking their best interest the way that love is defined. If you're looking for unity and you're wanting to be a reconciler, those, in my opinion, are sort of the mental stage that you're setting. The next section is really talking about how that looks in practice, which is the harder part. Uh, get, getting sort of your framework right is really, really important because you can't move on from that, that point. But the hard lessons and the things that I've changed in my life and my approach to leadership are in this next section. Some of the things we're going to talk about touch on some of these other points. And so uh, we may call those out as we go through here. But some of these other things that were part of my own small derailment uh, were present uh, in, in my experience. So remember, this is our scriptural reference, the playbook that I think is there to talk about what salt and light really looks like. And some of you may have actually looked up Ephesians 1 through 3 on your, in your Bibles on your handheld and saw that my previous uh, reference to this was actually missing verse 2. Uh, that, that when I read it to you, I s said, um, where am I? Yeah, okay. I said, a prisoner of the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And then I said, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. I left the verse 2 out. Because the verse 2 is actually talking about the salt. It's talking about the what. What are we going to do in our life? that actually puts into practice the way we think about other people. So the first thing is humility. We're going to act with humility, which is an inward thought process, right? I want to be self-aware. I don't want to just be others aware. I have to be self-aware. So it has to do with humility. The second thing we're going to talk about is gentleness, which is the outward action. Inward is humility, outward is gentleness. And then the last key word in that passage is patience, which is a forward action, okay? So, what's the opposite of humility? Pride? Pride, arrogance, hubris. 
Here's what Paul says. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. The humility thing didn't make total sense to me until I read a quote by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I used to think humility was deference. Somebody would come up and say, Mike, I thought you really did a good job at that. And I would say, oh, that was a team effort. Or, to God be the glory. Or, you know, I, I, you know what, I really thought I could do better on that. And none of those things are necessarily bad to God to be the glory. Uh, a lot of times it is a team effort. But humility isn't just deference. It's not necessarily deflecting praise. It's actually not having yourself at the center of your universe at all times. And arrogance and pride is putting yourself at the center of your universe and then treating everybody else as secondary. Paul says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. How do we do that? The key is in the last part of the passage. We, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Understanding my context, what it means to be me within the community that, that, that I serve within, is an important part of my self-awareness. So whatever I, whether I'm talking about church or whether I'm talking about workplace or my family, I'm just one participant in that community, and I have certain gifts and I have a certain role that I'm called to do, but understanding that context is so critical to being humble. It's accepting that role, understanding how I fit into the body, and understanding that there are all these other members of that body, all these other people working hopefully for the same goal, coming from different perspectives, having different backgrounds that need to be in relationship and in unity in order for us to accomplish our objectives. If you think of yourself more highly than you ought, than you ought you're probably elevating yourself above other people. You're putting yourself in a different classification. You're not acknowledging the fact that you're in community and are, in, are dependent upon that community for your own success. Remember the, the illustration, that moment that I was standing in my office looking out the window at Las Colinas and saying, this is what it feels like to have arrived. I'm standing by myself in that office thinking about what it feels like to be at that point in time without considering my team. It's by definition thinking of myself more highly than I ought because it wasn't thinking about whatever success may have come and what that feeling felt like within the context of, of the larger you know, company that I was part of. And to, to be put in the position you know, almost the very next day of being told by your partners, not only do I not want you to be my leader, I don't even want to work with you, is a very humbling experience. But that moment, and I remember I told you, as I was signing the papers that they were passing around, these legal papers and this surreal moment that that was happening, remember I told you, I realized that that's what I deserved. That this was the right thing, that that... I was sowing the seeds that I had planted. That's a flash of self-awareness. I would say that the thing that I would hope for all of you is that you would have the gift of self-awareness, that you would understand how you fit into your context, that you understand how you fit in relationship to others and into God, and having that self-awareness, knowing who you are and how you fit into God's plan, and as that evolves throughout your life, is the biggest gift that you can give yourself. And what are some of the things that we can do to have self-awareness, to really know ourselves, to think about our giftedness? Some of you may have already been exposed to different tools that help you explore your giftedness as you're thinking about the careers that you want to work in, right? Uh, Elise mentioned in her speech, I think, the DISC uh, approach. Uh, which is a personality test that 
tells you something about yourself. And I've taken all of them. I've taken Myers-Briggs and DISC. And I took the Gary Smalley test, which tells you if you're a lion or a Labrador, Labrador or what, whatever. Um, in our company, we use a, a tool called Culture Index that tells us a lot about ourselves, and it tells me a lot about the people that I work with. And um, my very best guy friend on the planet, uh, the, the, the one male friend that I have that I know I can talk to about anything that creates for me a 100% safe zone, and I create that for him, who's also one of my executive coaches, uh, brought this culture index to me and gave me the gift of even better self-awareness. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about it. I don't have time to go into the details. But knowing who I am helps me interact with those that are around me. And as I know something about them, it helps me interact with them. So here's my picture. This tells you that I am a, what you'd probably call type A, driven person. Most CEOs you're going to run into are. Probably all the ones you've heard from are. What that actually measures is the extent to which my my working environment, that I act in a self-centric mode. I'm a self-centric leader. The other side of the line would say that I was an others-centric leader. It's not a negative or a positive. But it tells you that when I look at my workplace, my perspective is where I'm standing right now. And so I look around and I see this opportunity and that opportunity and that challenge. And so my perspective is a 360-degree perspective from where I am. Remember that picture in Elise's deck where the guy's standing up on top of the mountain and he's looking at the next mountain? People who have a high A work trait are self-centric in the way that they view their work environment. If you're on the other side, you're other-centric, which means that you're looking at it as a team player, as somebody who is... Uh, in the details and thinking about it from sort of outside in. Those are great people too, and you can be a leader with the trait on either side. But like I said, most CEOs you're going to find are on, on, on that side of it. So that's me. My most dominant characteristic is I'm a raging introvert. So I can go into a room with a thousand people and give a speech, but if you put me in a room with a thousand people and ask me to mix, I'd rather, I'd rather jump off the cliff. Really? Um, my favorite activity is something where I can do things where nobody talks back, uh, especially after a long day at the office. So like mowing grass, getting on a tractor, uh, working on the property that we live on, uh, reading a book. I happen to be also married to an introvert, so the two of us can sit and watch TV and not talk to each other and be happy as clams. So I'm really blessed in that respect. It's awesome. But... Knowing that about myself is really important because if, if I let those two things run amok, think about somebody who's self-centric in their view but also a raging introvert. What's likely to happen in that scenario if you're not careful? How are you going to make decisions? Not thinking about other people. Not interacting with other people. The kind of way I made decisions that led up to the September 29th event. Uh, the other dot says that I'm very persistent. Um, I like to be single-threaded. I like to start something and get it done and then move on to the next thing. That's my preferred way of working. It's very frustrating to be CEO of a public company and have that dot because you really can't afford to work that way. So I'm always kind of adjusting for that. I have to be really careful to not get sort of dog on a bone determined on something that maybe deserves to, to die. And then the last one says that I really care a lot about the rules and, uh, of the game. Um, I'm justice oriented. I want things to be fair and equitable. And so I don't color outside the lines naturally. And I know this about myself. We also use this instrument with our people, especially our leadership team. And so when I sit down and talk to somebody and I know their profile and I know that they're a high B person who loves to be in a crowd and loves to mix and chat and, and talk about you know, your day and what's going on with your kids, then it helps me to interact with them in a way that's healthy versus thinking of them as being a real pain in, my, in the neck. Like they're interrupting my day by wanting to talk about, you know, how my day's going. And I'm like, well, it was going great until you kind of showed up and wanted to talk about my day. So it's important, right? But my friend, my best friend, says that knowledge is power. And if you use this information as a weapon, if you weaponize this, then it can turn into a really bad thing. 
I could walk around my workplace and see these dots above everybody's head. And I could just as easily use this to manipulate people as I could to actually get along with them, right? I shudder to think of if I'd have had access to this information before 1994 because this would have allowed me to actually manipulate my partners in such a way that they may not have been able to hold me accountable in the way that they were. I would encourage all of you to take advantage of a tool like this to, to start generating some self-awareness. And whether it's DISC or Myers-Briggs or even the Gary Smalley thing and you're a lion or an otter, love otters in small doses, um, I would encourage you to do that because self-awareness is such, such a gift. And it will also help you to know the path that you should go on and what looks like a path of least resistance. And if you find yourself challenged in a given situation, it might be because you're working against your, your natural giftedness, your natural work traits. So humility doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. You can know yourself, know your gifts, be confident in your gifts, and still not treat others like they were numbers. The second thing the passage said was gentleness. What's the opposite of gentleness? What? Aggressiveness? Aggressiveness? What else? Hostility. Hostility. That would really be the opposite, yes. If you're not gentle, you're rough, harsh, aggressive. The Tim McGraw song that was playing when I came up, my walk-up song. If y'all just listened to that song, we'd be done, because he says, always be gentle and kind. The scriptures say it too. Walk, with, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of your time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. I've heard several different times just over the day and a half that we've been here, questions like, how do you influence the world? How can you witness for Jesus? How can you impact people that you're working with in the workplace as if there's a formula, as if there's some magic silver bullet, as if there's some big thing that you have to do? How about start with being a good person and being gentle and kind? Because that is very distinctive in today's world. If you're gentle and kind and gracious and hopeful, People are going to ask you, why are you the way that you are? How do you deal with life's crisis in the way that you seem to deal with them? How, how come you're not, you know, blowing your top and cussing people out and doing the things that you see happen so often when things get stressful and out of control? And then you have the opportunity to give them the straight answer. It has a lot to do with my faith. It has a lot to do with that I'm called to relationship with you and to, to, to want the best for you and to talk about where that comes from in your life. Probably many of you already know this passage. Sometimes we're going to get made fun of. Sometimes when somebody says, hey, what's different about you? They're not saying that in a positive way. They're like, how come you're so conservative? Or why aren't you doing the things that the rest of us are doing? Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense or to explain to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So often when we go out to try to influence the world to affect our workplace, we don't do it with gentleness and respect. We go out there and, and we preach to people and we, we hit them over the head with our Bible and we talk about the reason that we're doing the things that we're doing out of some sense of pride, not out of the sense of grace that we have been offered in the fact that we are being healed from the brokenness that we have. But we should always be prepared to talk about why we are the way that we are. I wasn't like this. I, I wasn't... In, showing people around me anything that was different. I'm a child of the 80s. I grew up in the Reagan era when greed is good and making money's the, the scorecard. And I bought into that. 
And I was not witnessing in the workplace. And to be honest with you, I wasn't witnessing in any of the spheres of influence that I had particularly well. I wasn't ready to make a defense because I wasn't offering anybody a reason to ask me for the hope that was in me. This is probably the most important thing. If you can walk with outsiders with kindness and gentleness and respect and show them that you honor and appreciate them, they will ask you why you are the way that you are. I said three books. Here's another one. This is a, a book that is published by the Barna Institute in collaboration with ACU. It's called Christians at Work. If you ever wanted to, to just read research and articles about why the workplace is a missional place, that research speaks to that point. It also says in their research that Christians broadly, overwhelmingly, feel like they're called to minister in their various workplaces and that they feel like you don't have to be clergy to do it. I think that's a major change since I came into the workplace compared to where hearts and minds of Christians are today. I think it's a great thing. It's a great opportunity. The research also says that something like 70% of the people surveyed believe that their church was not equipping them for that task. That means that there's a job for us to do, which is one of the reasons I appreciate this venue so much. What's the opposite of patience? And don't say impatience. What's the opposite of patience? This is a hard one. It's a trick question. Forwardness? What do you mean by that? So um, over-eager, uh, rushed, hasty, frustrated. Most people think that the opposite of patience is impatience or being rushed, uh, careless maybe. Depends on how you look at the two words. Some people think patience means too laid back or reactive. My opinion is that the opposite of patience is anxious. If you're not patient, then you're probably wrapped around the axle over things that you have no control over. James had something to say about that. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we're going to go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. It doesn't say that you shouldn't make plans, have expectations, be working energetically and actively to accomplish those plans day to day. But as soon as you move into the mode that says, I have control over these events, this is how it's going to work out, now you're boasting and now you're in an arrogant mode. And what that usually does is it leads to anxiety because you're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow and the fact that you don't have control really over the things that are going to happen tomorrow. So the reality is that tomorrow I could walk in and my board of directors could fire me from being you know, at my job today. You will in your careers have setbacks. You'll lose jobs. You're going to get laid off. You're going to have disappointments. But if I walked into my office tomorrow and the board of directors said, you know, we don't want you to be the CEO of PFS Web any longer, I know it would not be because I was derailed. It's just one of those things that happens, especially for CEOs of public companies. I've been doing this thing for almost six years, which is longer than you might expect. You see these uh, the slogan on T-shirts all over the place. You know where that comes from? Keep calm. That's exactly where it came from. So England thought they would put posters up all over town that said, keep calm. What was happening? Bombs were dropping from the sky and blowing up buildings and killing people right and left. Well, I don't know if any of us expect to be in a situation where bombs are dropping from the sky, but I know that sometimes the day brings as much as we can handle. Patience means I'm willing to stay in the moment 
I'm willing to do the thing that God has called me to do at this moment in time, and I'm willing to not be in control of what's going to happen tomorrow, and therefore I can lay my head down on my pillow and sleep at night because I'm not in charge of what's going to happen tomorrow. It does not mean that I'm coasting through life without any expectations, without any activities, without any plans. It simply means that I'm willing to admit that I'm not in control of the outcome. That's the forward-looking. Inward, humility. Outward, gentleness. Forward, patience. I think Ephesians 1 through 3 is a pretty good playbook for what it looks like to be salt and light. I would encourage you all to capture that passage and think about it. If I was going to read one chapter of the Bible, and only one chapter, and I was going to read that over and over again, maybe every day, 1 Corinthians 13. You know, in the end, it doesn't really matter what else you do. If you don't do it out of love, you're just full of hot air. That's a paraphrase. I'm going to end up with, with two stories. So I know what, if there was such a thing back in 1984 as a 360-degree review, and, and there wasn't, but I know that if I would have asked the company to do a 360 on me, that the truthful responses that come back would not have been flattering, clearly. And to be honest with you, CEOs don't really ever get truly honest 360s. But we do have the ability to, to gauge how we're doing culturally and how we're leading our teams. I think Elise said, maybe it was Wendy. I think it was Wendy. It's not having all the answers that's important. It's having all the right questions. One of the things that I have to do, especially with my profile, is be very intentional about trying to understand how I'm leading and what kind of salt and light am I being in my environment. And the way you do that is you gather feedback. You participate in life with your teammates. You get in and work beside them. You ask them for feedback. You listen when they have complaints. You read Glassdoor, which is horrible, by the way. Um, it's horrible. Because how many of you fill out a, a survey card at a restaurant when you're happy? Nobody does that. The only time you fill out a card at a restaurant is when you didn't have a good experience. So most of the things that go on Glassdoor are when people are unhappy. But it does give you an opportunity to listen to what people are saying. And sometimes there's some things you need to hear. So I think on Glassdoor right now I have about a 64% rating, which is actually not bad for a CEO. I told you I had two brands in my company, PFS and Liberia. Right now, my PFS business is doing really, really well. Uh, we're doing all the right things. We have all the momentum. Everything's going great. Uh, we're going to have a lot of great things happen this year, as far as I can tell. Um, it's all happy on that side of the business. Everybody's, like, coming into work and, like, oh, this is great. The irony is about a year and a half ago, it was the opposite. Uh, we had a lot of things we were fixing. We had a lot of work to do. I had a lot of people who were not particularly happy with where they were. We just did the hard work to fix it. Now my other side of the business has the flu. And so we're working on that side of the business and fixing some things. And so it's not so happy on that side of the business. Um, maybe by the end of the year we got both of them, you know, in a good place. But that's just the way it is. They call it work for a reason. So one of the things that, that, that we do in my company, culturally, uh, the PFS side of the business where we're actually shipping product out to customers and we're answering phones and we're doing payment processing and all that work gets really intense during the holiday. Makes sense, right? Everybody's ordering online. They're having products shipped you know, to their house for the holiday. And there's this thing called uh, Cyber Monday, Black Friday. This whole season from the week of Thanksgiving all the way through Christmas for us is just crazy. Um, a lot of our clients who are retailers will do 35 or 40% of their entire annual volume in a five- or six-week period between Thanksgiving and Christmas, which is just nuts. And, and frankly, it's a horrible business model. It's not very sustainable, but that's just where it is today. And so we have to ramp up our operation in order to support our clients, which means that in my PFS business, I'm going to go from about 2,500 employees to almost 4,000 employees for a six-week period of time. 
That's crazy. So one of the things that we do is our management team goes into the operation and actually works side by side with all of our full-time people and these seasonal people that come into our operation. So I spend two weeks every year in Memphis, Tennessee, working in a distribution center, packing boxes and running a pick cart and patting people on the back and picking up you know, trash off the floor and, and just working. And our CFO does the same thing and our senior leadership team does the same thing. And we go into the operation and we work side by side with our people during the most intense time that we have just to be there. One of the things that I do at the end of that two week period is I do a tour uh, of the facilities, we have uh, five, and just go around and, and say thank you uh, to the leaders in each of the buildings and the people who've gone above and beyond, and I collect that input from the team. Pat on the back, thank you so much for all your hard work. I don't care if you're seasonal or if you're full-time, if you're leadership, it doesn't matter. Express my gratitude. And then I go on a worldwide tour and do the same thing in Toronto and in Belgium and in the UK, and I end up in India with our office there which makes December a lot of fun. Um, I get executive platinum every single year, largely just because of that. But that's part of the gig. And then I collect from my team who deserves special consideration, who really deserves a personal note from me of thanks. And this year, I got 157 names. And New Year's Day, I wrote 157 emails to individuals specifically about the thing that they had done to contribute to that year. Here's two, just two, of the responses. Employee A is one of our uh, directors, which is a mid-level management team member working in Memphis, who I sent a note to, and who said, I got a chance to thank you face-to-face, -face, but I wanted to send you a note I send a note to the group to say how grateful and appreciative I am for the acknowledgement. When he said group, it's actually just me and um, the general manager of PFS. This has been a journey for me, and the PFS team is more a family than coworkers. Your support and encouragement means the world to me, and I'm proud and honored to be part of such a great team. That never would have happened in 1994. All right, here's the one that will make me cry. This guy is um, a senior leader. He's in charge of one of our facilities in Memphis, a, a big facility. He's got 500 people working for him during the holiday. In um, August of this year, uh, his wife, who was very healthy, no medical problems, suffered a stroke and died. And I, did, I don't know this guy well. Um, I worked beside him and when I would go to that facility I would walk up and you know grab his hand and give him a hug which is kind of the, the thing I do with with all of my senior leadership team uh, but I, I don't know him personally. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a big African-American fellow that's pretty quiet about personal stuff but um, he was in crisis and our team there did a good job of taking care of him I gave him a call and said, you know, we're praying for you. Let us know what we can do to support you. The thing that he needed was just to be able to get away from his job, take care of his family. So we said, you know, go take as much time as you need. He said, you know, I'll be back before holiday. And we said, you know, don't worry about it if, if, that's, if that's not going to work. We gave him the time to go be with his family. He came back uh, on the job the, the second week in November, so literally two weeks before the holiday. I flew to Memphis on the Saturday of his wife's funeral, went to the funeral, out in the parking lot. His family was great. What an awesome woman. It was an awesome church funeral. Christian funerals are the best ever because we know where that person is and we're celebrating for them, but it's hard. And out in the parking lot, I went up and did my customary grab your hand, give the guy a hug. And we're here for you. And literally for a minute, he held me and just we wept. This big, strong African-American guy who doesn't share his feelings just wept and said, 
you know, thank you for being here. Here's his response. When I look back on the last 16 years, and some of the sacrifices I've made, the tolls on my body, hundreds of hour work weeks, moving a thousand miles from anyone I know, I have few regrets. If any one thing didn't happen, I wouldn't be here today. I, I have been a leader at some great companies, but my time here at PFS Web has been the best nearly three years of my professional career. I've never worked for an organization that values its people and what they bring to the table like PFS does. Yes, a lot has changed over the last two years, and I'm proud to have played a part in making that change possible, seeing the things that I put my personal touch on come alive this week has been one of the most incredible feelings I've ever experienced. The level of collaboration and teamwork here is truly amazing. That's what makes it all worth it. And I, I'm not showing you that to brag on myself or to say we have the best company in the world, but it's opportunities like that to, to measure and gauge how effective that I am and how effective we are in creating a culture that actually does honor and value people, aspire to treat them right as image bearers, to want the best for them, to help create an opportunity for them to reach their potential, to create a unified environment that inspires collaboration. That inspires humility and gentleness and patience, then this makes it all worth it. That's my scorecard. That's my journey. I don't tell this story to hardly anybody. Uh, I've told it twice at Summit. Uh, it's not a fun story. Um, the slides here, this is the first time I've used them. I don't know if I'll ever use them again. But Rick asked me to speak to you about something that I would want you to hear that might make a difference in your life. And I think that if you think about being salt and light and the way that you treat people and the way that you're self-aware, that you come down off this mountain and it can start making a difference for you next week and not in some distant 20-year place where you may or may not be some senior executive in a company. I wish I would have had the opportunity to sit there where you're sitting and somebody speak that truth to me and that I would have paid attention and maybe avoided that particular tra unexpected transition. But as I said, no regrets. I'm pretty happy with where I am at this point and praise God for him making that possible. All right, we've got 20 minutes for Q&A. And there's two mics. Yes. Hi, Chance. Hello. Hello, Hello. Chance. There we go. <laughs> I was just asking, um, not to be more depressing, but was there anything that you could speak to kind of some of the specifics that kind of happened back in that in 1994, or, yeah, 94, just to, as to what they kind of told you to what led to that? Not to be more depressing. <laughs> You know, the, the, the really strange thing about, so first off, all, all four of my partners were guys. So the really strange thing about the whole experience is there wasn't a lot said. You know, that was the weird thing is that you have these legal documents going by. And I'll tell you the weirdest thing about the day, the whole day was really strange. So first off, I'm going into a normal everyday meeting and we're sitting down and all of a sudden this, there's our corporate attorney and these four guys and the papers fly and all this stuff. We'd signed all the papers. And I said, okay, guys, now that we've signed these papers, let's talk about how to make this, you know, work. Uh, because I own 45% of the company. So, you know, I, you don't want me to own 45% of the company if I'm not around. And so we were starting to have that dialogue. And all of a sudden, the fire alarms went off. And we had some fire alarm thing. And so we all had to empty the building and go to the parking lot. And so we're all sitting there in the parking lot, you know. And I'm like, what, what is going on? This is the weirdest day ever. And so, like, 20 minutes later, we filed back in, and we all sat down, and we just, like, started where we left off. It was the weirdest thing. Nobody ever said to me, 
you're like the biggest jerk ever, and you deserve that. You know, there, there wasn't that kind of closure. Um, I, had, I had to work through that myself. I, I had to think about what had happened and sort of wrestle with that. And I, so, I said it took a year, and it did take a year. But there wasn't any shouting or yelling or cussing or name call, calling, any of that stuff. In fact, the, the lack of emotion was almost one of the most unsettling things about it. I'd almost mm-hmm. rather. But I talked about what's the opposite of gentleness or what's the opposite of humility. What's the opposite of love? What? The opposite of love is indifference. If you hate somebody, you still have an emotional connection with them and the possibility that that could be turned to love. But if you have indifference for them, they're nowhere. What happened in that room was indifference. I didn't deserve anything more. But that, that's probably the most depressing thing. Um, and I'm not saying anybody should hate anybody. Um, God doesn't hate anybody. He hates things. Talks about a lot of things God hates, not people. Don't be indifferent towards people in your life. Another question. Come on. There you go. My name's Luke. My name's Luke. Hello, um, Luke. Uh, I just wanted to know if you have any like daily practice that we can do. I know reading the Bible obviously is something that we need to work on every morning, but to continue and grow in our self awareness. Um, just like a, almost like a ritual thing that you do every morning to make sure that you kind of stay focused on that. Yeah, so I, this question gets asked of me a lot, and I have a horrible answer. I don't have a daily ritual to start the day because hardly any day starts the same. Um, I'm like all over the place, so... I'll be in Bangalore, I'll be in London, I'll be in New York, I'll be waking up at home, I'll have a 6 o'clock conference call that to jump on, or maybe I get to sleep in till 7, or it, it, my life is so variable day to day that the, the only consistent time that I have is at the end of the day. So, and, and there's lots of things that I do to, during the day, manage myself. Uh, which is to take opportunities to shut down interaction, think about where I am in that day, what I want to accomplish, the people I'm expected to interact with, seek guidance from God. My prayer life is very choppy, lots of little conversations and not a lot of big conversations. I'd like to work on that, maybe have a little bit better mix, but that's just my, that's just my life. But the, the one place where I try to be intentional is at the back end of the day. And there's two reasons for that. One is it's been the most consistent place where I can reconnect with my family, especially Crystal. Um, Even if I'm traveling, it's usually possible for me to reconnect with her at the back end of the day. And reconnecting with her and sort of getting back into, for me, the sort of anchor point of my life is important and it recenters me. And usually that's when we talk about things that are like really important going on in our life. And, you know, if there's something that we need to kind of wrestle with, we'll we'll do that at the back end of the day. So that's the most important time for me that's the most consistent. The other thing is that my profile is such that I've got this, I've just constantly got things in my head. So if I don't have a gap between work whatever kind of work it is, whether it's you know, church work or family work or PFS work, if I don't have a gap between the time that, that that shuts down and the time I go to bed, then it's really hard for me to sleep. So for me, the hour or so that Crystal and I can do something fairly mindless, just be together, is a way for me to shut that off and ease into sleep. So we've done that. And if I'm not with her physically, then I'll call her and we'll talk. And then I'll shut all the stimulus down, read the Bible, do something that's meditative in order to, for me to shut down. Because if I go to bed thinking about a business problem, I'm going to think about it all night and I'll be dream about it. And then solutions you dream up are horrible. Another question? That's a great one, by the way. I wish I had a better answer. I really do. Um, <clears throat> Riley, um, so you mentioned about how so you got fired, and then you had that year by yourself. 
when you got back into another company, how did you see that your ways changed the, that next time around? Uh, gradually. Um, you, you know, it wasn't uh, like, hey, I'm back and I'm different. Um, I had the benefit of people who I was around in certain events that happened during the year. Uh, I worked side by side with one of my best friends who's a strong Christian who spoke truth to me. I went to my first Promise Keepers event uh, in 1995. Um, there were just various things that kind of helped me to heal. And also, God put me in a context where when I came back into the workforce, I, I, I gradually came into a position of managing other people. You know, it was just me for the first year, and then I had a couple people that gathered around, and, and we had a more naturally collaborative, you know, uh, relationship, the nature of the things that we were doing. And I got to sort of test out some of my new skills and make some mistakes, get grace. And it wasn't until, you know, 2000 that I had more than 20 people reporting to me. Um, it wasn't until 2006 that I had, you know, more than 1,000 people reporting to me, you know, uh, all the way through the or organization. So God has done a really good job of not letting me get too far ahead of myself and continue to learn along the way by making mistakes but making it in a way that, you know, there's a safety net and I've got people talking back to me about things I could do better. One more? Just one more. Okay, sorry. Hi. Yeah. Hi, I'm Toby. Um, you mentioned um, earlier in your second session about personality tests that you take. Are those tests really to help shape the work environment, or are they, or are they mostly just for employers um, or CEOs? So I, th I think it all depends on how you intend to use the information. Um, those tests can be just for fun and, you know, you find out you're a lion or an otter or a retriever. Um, or I've seen companies that, you know, you did the disc test and then you kind of wore like your color around and stuff and it was on your badge or on your, your door plate, which I think is kind of a little bit crazy. But, you know, it, it really depends on how intentional you want to be within your corporate culture of how you use this information. And the, the best answer is that without weaponizing it, you use the information to help people get along better because sometimes people get along because their personalities clash or their profiles clash. And it isn't actually really anything structurally or that they're bad and you're good or anything, but you know, if you take my profile and put me with somebody who's high B, which means they're very social, we should be together in small doses, okay? So when I go to a trade show, I'm gonna be at one next, next, uh, next week, uh, I'm going to be in a booth, and there's going to be a lot of salespeople around. They're all high B. They're just crazy. They're talking all the time. And, and I'm going to participate in that. But at the end of the day, I'm going to go home and, like, uh, you know, don't want to talk to anybody. Knowing that about myself and knowing that about the people I'm going to interact with will help me to get along with them. And the fact that they know me. Let me give you the best example, and then, and then we'll be done. If you walk into my office in Allen, Texas today, and you walk in, You'll see over here uh, a shelf that has tractors and cars on it. Uh, it has Mustangs and Corvettes, which are the cars that I love, and it's got some tractors, and you know, th there's this uh, About Mike little bookshelf over here. Uh, over on this wall is a picture of my family and some faith-based stuff that's over here. I've got my diploma and my distinguished alumni and some pictures over here. Everywhere around my office, there's some things that say something about me. Why do I do that? I do that when somebody walks in and, and we have to have a conversation that there's an opportunity for them to already know something about me to start conversation because I'm the worst small talker in the world, right? I don't want to come in and talk about the Super Bowl or, you know, whatever happened over the weekend. And I'm not natural at it. But if you're sitting down and we're trying to connect and you're having trouble, there's stuff that will help the, the conversation. The other thing that I will do when you walk in my office, I'm usually going to be sitting at, if I'm in the office, I'm going to be sitting at my keyboard. If you walk in my office and want to talk, we're going to, I'm going to get up from my desk and I'm going to walk over to a little sitting area 
and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to look at you and we're going to have a conversation. Because if I let you sit at my desk, you know what I'm going to do the whole time? I'm going to look back at my computer because I think there's an email that's going to pop up I want to pay attention to, or I'm looking at whatever's on there. So I'm going to walk over here to focus on you in order to, to be able to interact with you and get past my natural profile. So the best answer is that this information helps people get along better. And if you have a team that comes together and you know something about each other on the team, it makes it easier for you to actually just naturally interact with each other and give each other grace when things sometimes aren't going the best. All right, thank you.